airline, menacing and fast. If it's not menacing, he didn't have to pay attention to it. But if I put a gun in his head, he's got to pay attention to it. Whether it be physical, moral, or mental. And when I'm talking about menacing, not to just kill him, as long as you can threaten something that's of value to him. That's of value to him. It all has to be value. But his position of pecking order, respect from his peers, or his life, whatever it may be, as long as it's value to him, he's got to play the game. Menacing and faster. So basically, if you look at this double dash system, after the double dash, what am I really saying here? In some sense, what you're really trying to do is generate a mismatch between that which he perceives and that which he must react or adapt to. So therefore, if I can work my way through the loop faster than he can or get inside his loop, then we generate those mismatches. I'm going to give you a feel. Let me illustrate. Give you a feel. It's a very important point. Let's assume we in this room are going to go up and get some adversaries or some other group established, which you people eventually will be doing here. Clearly. Okay, now let's assume, for the sake of the academic argument, that we can operate that fast with tempo or pace. In other words, we can get inside his loop. In fact, we call it OODOs, O-O-D-A, OODOs. You'll hear that term, O-O-D-A, OODOs. So let's assume we can get inside his OODOs. What does that mean? If he goes to make a move, we adjust inside that move, so his move now is no longer relevant. If he tries to remove, we adjust again, it's no longer relevant. Well, after you know, after a couple of those, he's going to notice he's losing out. In other words, he's going further and further away from his goal. We're also going to notice we're going further and further closer to our goal. Well, if it's a competitive situation, he values what's going on. What's that going to do to him? Doubt and certainty is going to begin in the build up in his mind. And if we keep that pace on and don't take the pressure off, we can transform that doubt and certainty into confusion and disorder. You've probably seen where people when we're pressure starts coming out, we do strange and bizarre things. It makes it even worse, unless somebody takes a squeeze off. Now, if you have one group going against another group, and a group, that other group's losing out, whatever it may be, then they start transmitting those doubts, fears, and uncertainties one to the other. So not only confusion disorder, panic and chaos come out. You can just see it well up. They come panic, they're totally unglued. Can't function as an organic whole. Not only that, they start pointing fingers at one another, because nobody wants to be a failure. That even helps even more. You've never seen that before, have you? <laughs> of course you have. You've heard the statement. Victory has a thousand fathers, the thieves and orphans. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. Nobody wants to take the blame. So if you have groups going against one of those doubts and fears begin to well up, they can transform into panic chaos. And I'll show you. So it's a very important idea. I'm trying to get inside his system. The idea being when you get inside is to generate mismatches between that which he must what he perceives and that which he must yeah. Okay? So we have an example. It turns out I'll show you three here. And the one the first one that came to my mind that threw me in a historical investigation was the Blitz Creek versus the Magic Line mentality in The Very first book I picked up. Everybody's talking about the very fast tempo, very fast pace the Germans are going. The French couldn't keep up. Pretty soon, confusion, disorder, panic, chaos came to the I said, that's very impressive. And while I know that happened, because there were so many accounts that depicted that, what I didn't know, what were the internal dynamics associated with the Blitzkrieg that permitted them to do that? One thing to know the result, you literally want to understand the dynamics. Because if you understand the dynamics, maybe you can do it to somebody else or make it very difficult for somebody else to do it to you. Once again, not just in a physical sense, but also a moral mental sense. So it would be important to understand that if you can. Now, I'm not going to bring it out here because that's why I went to my historical investigation. Okay, but we'll, when we go into that, we'll show you what happened in terms of those post-creek dynamics and why they're able to get their leverage over their adversary if they can't cope with it. Now here's one I am very familiar with, the 86 versus the MiG-15. Now, typically today, many people, or until very recently, people thought the MiG-15 was a more maneuverable airplane than the 86. That was a general contention, that was a general projection. Well, I will dispel that today. I'll show you why. I'll make it very compelling and convincing. For one thing, we have a new frame of reference to which we can compare those airplanes. We have the Udu, observe, orient, decide, that. Or we'll use that frame of reference, and we'll put them, juxtapose one against the other, and see what happens. So let's take the first O, observation. 
86 versus the MiG-15. The MiG-15 was slightly smaller than the 86. So from the size viewpoint, it would have an observation advantage over the 86. Might be insignificant, but it's still there. On the other hand, the 86 had what we call a super bubble canopy, the MiG did, did not. So in terms of the ability to see out, the 86 was much better. And the pilots that flew both the airplanes commented upon the fact it was easier for an 86 pilot to see a MiG-15 than the other way around. In other words, the ability to see out more than washed away the small size of the So from an observation viewpoint, the 86 had the advantage over the MiG-15. Okay, orientation and decision, I'll keep together. That not only depends upon observation, but it also depends upon your previous experience and training. And if that's pretty bad, then your orientation is going to be screwed up. Too. You're going to make inappropriate decisions, so even your actions can be wrong. Well, we generally accorded our pilots, as at least as a corporate group, for better trained and more experienced in the company. Now let's go to the action where this thing really comes out and tends to show the MiG might be better than 86. If you were to compare the MiG versus the 86, you would find out that the MiG 15 could outclimb and outaccelerate the 86 throughout the entire flight on board, and in some parts by very significant amount. Outclimb and outaccelerate the F 86. In terms of the ability to sustain a turn, the MiG was also superior to the 86 throughout the entire flight on board. In terms of the ability to go what we call instantaneous or up to pitch up or stall, in an airplane. There are some areas 86 is better to make and vice versa. And then if you were to sort of integrate, pull all that together, you'd say, well, on that basis there, ergo, the MiG-15 is superior to the 86. And on that basis, it's not a bad conclusion. Unfortunately, some things were left out. It turns out the 86 had what we call a super hydraulic flight control system for that time. High power hydraulic bike controls, just like you have power steering in the car. 2,800 pounds per square inch, so you could just move the stick from one way to the other and make the airplane hop very quickly from one direction to the other and pull back. The MiG did not. The point was, when an 86 got bounced by a MiG, it would, it would lag a little bit, it could flip-flop its turn quickly the other direction, and the MiG took a long one. 86 could flip-flop its direction again, so it would do a very quick scissor maneuver and just stuff the MiG out front, even though the MiG, for one particular maneuver, could stay behind an 86, and 86 could transition or shift from one maneuver more rapidly than the 86, I mean, than the main. And so by going these very quick reversals, the main couldn't do it. It just stuck in the floor. Because remember, you've got to overcome those air loads. And the faster you go, the more the air load, the more muscle power you have to use. Well, you have to put a substitute in there. That's called hydraulic power. It's like power steering in a car. Make it happen. So are we going to say, then, the ability to roll or pitch or roll-pitch combination isn't a part of maneuverability? Well, that's absurd. It certainly is. Well, if that's a part of maneuverability, then how can you say the MiG could outmaneuver the 86? Can't. The 86 was one When you look at it, broader sense. Because it could shift its ability to slip into one maneuver or another, more readily than the main. And the pilots, they noticed certain things would happen. When they began to get leverage over another pilot, his maneuvers tend to get disjointed and bizarre. In fact, they commented upon that. It seemed like their minds were coming unglued. They talked about getting inside their minds. They get inside their minds in terms of fear, doubt, and certain guys are going to die. They, people normally don't take that comment. <laughs> <laughs> so we're all vulnerable. In fact, you can go back to World War II. There's an account by Don Gentile. He's a P-51 pilot. You might have heard about him. World War II, P-51H over in Europe. He commented upon a couple instances in his life when he was fighting a couple of Germans one day, I forget, either ME 109 or Bakul 190. But he commented upon the fact that he didn't fight start out, they're pretty equal, but he began to get leverage as the other guy's maneuver became disjointed. One guy literally flew into the ground, literally just flew right into the ground. And the other guy's maneuver came to shot him down. And he even made a point, he said, he almost could see their minds just coming into it. Because referring back one day, he wasn't doing so well, and it started, all that started welling up in him, and he probably had a hard time on top of the situation. We're all wrong. Think about your own life. At times, think back at times when you have certain things you want to do, you have time pressure, and it's sort of not sh sure you're going to make it, and then somebody loads something else on you, before you start getting very nervous. You, first thing you're trying to do is relieve that pressure so you can get this done and that done. But if you won't relieve it, it bothers you. Particularly it's about bad Value. It's no value. One you know, of value can be no problem. That's the medicine. So that happens. We've seen it. 
No, nope. in Israeli rain. We're talking about the Entebbe rain, 1976, another example. Get it out in 90 minutes, right? They all men in the troops, they no, even knew what hit them. They're just all totally out of the game. Can you think of any other? Let me just lay out for you right now. In any case, if we stitch all that together, we come up with a new conception. It's really, it's been there all the time. We just somehow didn't see it. You want to exploit your operations of weapons such that you deliberately generate a rapidly changing environment in terms of quick clear observations, orientations, decisions, tempo, etc. In other words, you want to compress the time over which you can realize those events. Likewise, what you want to do is you want to inhibit your adversary's capacity to adapt to such an environment. In other words, cloud or distort his observations, screw up his decisions, etc. Warfare, camouflage, spoofing. Deception, other kinds of things. Ambiguity. So you want to compress your time, stretch out his time. And that's the idea. Simultaneously do both. Compress own time and stretch out adversary time to generate a favorable mismatch of time and ability to adapt, to shape and adapt and change. Remember, you're not only adapting, but you're shaping. Don't, don't, don't just be a reactor. Be a shaper, too. You're trying to compress your time. You're trying to generate that mismatch in time and ability to shape and adapt to change. Now, if you can realize that, that idea, then the goal always happens almost as a natural consequence. If you realize that, you're going to get this goal almost as a natural consequence. Call it. You'll start to collapse his system of confusion disorder, cause him to over and under react and do crazy kinds of things. Because you not only appear menacing because there's something about it there, but also ambiguous, chaotic, misleading, etc. Competition, adversarial relations. This is more than just war. War, you know, it's not the body count. That's it's pretty narrow. It's more than body count. That's why we got screwed up in Vietnam. We are only about body count. So this is a much more general definition. Apply to war, apply to very soft kinds of things, or even intermediate things. Any kind of competitive behavior, whatever it might be. And you see it works on somebody's what? the ideas or notions I had in my mind before I dove into my historical investigation. And remember, the reason why I wanted to get into that was because of the book. I sort of see what's happening here in terms of the results. But what were those internal dynamics? Well, as I got into that, I found out in order to understand Bushbrick, I had to read military history. I read military history. The reason why I did that because Guderian and the others who helped shape the Bushbrick would refer to an earlier year of military history have a one-liner. Well, I don't know what it meant. I mean, I knew what the words said, but I didn't know the, the context. So I had to go back and read it. Now when I learned the context, I said, okay, I got that, and I had to learn others. Pretty soon, as I'm going through it, I can't. I just can't talk about Blitzkrieg. I look at guerrilla warfare, regular warfare, dirty tricks, all the kinds of stuff. War in general, or competition in general. And then it became very evident to me when you look at that. The statement I'm going to make now, I almost made it a few minutes ago. The statement I'm going to make now, you're going to see I'm going to say, say it more than once as I go through this presentation. But we still, in some ways, don't understand it. Remember, terrain doesn't wage wars. Machines don't wage wars. People do when they use their mind. So if I go after the terrain or the machine, I'm going to have to go over and over and over again. But if I go after somebody's mind, then I got the people, then I got the machines, then I got the terrain. talking about human behavior or human, human nature. After all, humans are the 
deal with climate competition. So maybe that should be our starting point. So let's go back to the And we're going to get right down to the very simple fundamentals to start this thing. First of all, I think we want to survive, otherwise die by the way. As a group, we want to survive. Not only that you want to survive, you tend to want to survive in your own terms. In other words, you don't want to have you don't want to have to survive under onerous circumstances. You want to have some control over your survival, some freedom of action. Well, if you begin to think about that, in some sense, you want to improve your capacity for independent action. Whether you're talking about individuals, groups, nation states, or what have you. But it turns out we live in a world of limited resources, not only in terms of physical, skills, talents, the whole nine yards. So if we improve our capacity for independent action, and there's limited resources, we're going to tend to deprive somebody of their capacity for independent action. Or if we improve our, our ability to survive on our own terms, we tend to deny him. Or if we really get sharp, we can make it impossible for him to survive at all. You people don't have, there's, you don't have to worry about survival with your job. <laughs> Remember, we're not going to talk physical, we're talking about anything of that. <coughs> so the implication is quite clear. Life is conflict, survival, and conflict. Period. It can be soft, it can be intermediate, it can be sharp. That's the way it is. Remember, World War I was a war to end all wars. That didn't work out too good. World War II, we'll make the world preserve the world for democracy. That hasn't gone too and I can go on and on. And you people don't have to compete for your particular job anywhere. It's, it's given to you free, free lunch. Always. So you not only have conflict, you have survival and conquest in many different modes or nuances. That's what. So, that being the case, it leads me to this comment. If that's the case, we're not only talking about conduct the war, but we can also bring other ideas in, like the theory of natural selection. You know, creationists might not like that too well, but one of the interesting things about the theory of natural selection, some of it's under challenge today, too, but not all of it, some of it's holding up, is because whether you're talking about war or these ideas of evolution, they impinge very much upon this idea of conflict, struggle, coping, adapting, etc. And many different views are brought up. We want to look at those views. Remember, I said we don't want the elegant solution or the definitive solution. We want to look at why. Because our adversary has done elegant solutions, we know his plus some other ones that we have never shared. I'll bring that on a different way to get through it. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you want to accept your adversary's viewpoint. You better understand it. We like the mirror image. You know, we've got a right to hell with them. We're just going to take them out before we get in trouble. You have to understand that. I'll make that evidence we get through. Okay, so that's why I want to look through these kinds. And what happens when we do that? I'm going to give you an overall, what I call an overall initial impression here. I'm going to go right back to corner BC. Initial impression I got out of after a few years look. Pretty soon things start ticking off in my head because I'm looking at a lot of data, looking at many different forms. And this is the impression I was left with. I'll let you read it, and I'll comment on it. Can you all read that all right? If I get out of your way. Under this first double dash thing here, variety and rapidity. To give you a feel for what I'm referring to, why variety and rapidity is important, let's turn the argument around and say we don't have variety, we can't operate rapidly. What does that mean? That means you lose your ability to adapt, you also become predictable. In conflict, you want to have adaptability and unpredictability. You have no choice. Because if you become predictable and non-adaptable, you lose. <coughs> you have to the other way around. That's why it's important. That's why those so called elegant not only that, you have to learn how to work with other people. So you can work as a concerted whole. You have to be able to harmonize your activity or cooperate. If 
you don't, you can't work it. Everybody has ultimate freedom of action. Then you got a mob, just everything going off in all directions. You can't work. You can't function. So there has to be some kind of things you invoke in order to permit people to focus and bring about that. Way. We get to harmonize our activities. We we'll get into that deeper. And then finally, even if you can operate rapidly with the variety of harmonize. You just can't sit there and let the world take care of you. It won't. You have to take initiative. In other words, you want to be a shaper, you want to be a rat. You have to take initiative. And this is where the military's got it screwed up, I'll bring out later on. They don't understand this. They get it confused with offensive and defensive. I can take initiative whether I'm in the offensive, defense, or wherever I am. Those are incorrect terms. It's initiative, whether you're moving forward, backwards, sideways, or any direction. As long as you are using the, lever uh, the initiative, then you can get that leverage. We'll make that evidence as we go through. So what I'm really saying, these are very important qualities. And later on what we'll do, we'll only bring those out, but we'll show you how they tie together. We mesh them right together with the so-called Uru. How they play together. That would be evidence to work our way through the presentation. Okay, with that in mind now, let's step back to the earliest known treatise on war. Sun Tzu is the art of war. How many people read it? Anybody here? Okay. The Art of War. You get some arguments when it was written. Some say 500 BC, some say 300. <coughs> I added together, divided by two, and bureaucratically averaged it, it came out around 400. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who's right. That's what we call bureaucratic averaging. <laughs> two polls say fine. Add them together, divide by two, we got it right where we want it. Each guy's got a piece of the action. Okay, in any case, we look at Sun Tzu's Art of War, here's a theme that begins to unfold. Note that first bullet, harmony. Those people who read it will recall in this very first chapter, what's he talking about? How does citizens have to be in accord with the rulers of the estate? They have to be able to be in accord or harmonize with the rulers of the state. They have to harmonize with one another and also the rulers of the state. Without that, the state can't even rule. It's the most important thing. Same thing in political party. What you want to do is get disharmony in the opposite party so you can realize your leverage. So the very first thing you've got to get is get harmony in your operation. Get people to work together so you can get that leverage. But Sun Tzu understood that back in BC. That was very important. Another thing that literally drips throughout the treatise or to ask, the idea of deception. And more than once he makes a statement all war is based upon deception, but other kinds of conflict aren't. All war is based upon deception. He says it Another notion he brings up, the idea of being quick, speedy, or swift, what I call swiftness of action. He said the essence of war is rapidity, swiftness, etc. Also states that more than one. Then he brings in a notion in a very indirect way, which I call fluidity of action, which he brings out in a very metaphorical way. In fact, that's one thing when you first read Sun Tzu, you're not sure what you read. It's metaphors, aphorism, and analogy. So you say, boy, that was great with all that read. <laughs> something you pull out, something you don't get right away, because your Western mind, you're not tuned to it. And one of those is related to what I call fluidity of action. For those people who read it will remember, he made the statement, armies should behave like water going downhill. Both for the weakness, the voids, the fissures, the gaps. Now think about that for a moment. If the armies can behave like water, and if water does that, what he's really saying, in some sense, you want to impose your strength against your adversary's weakness. That's one aspect of it. Another aspect is flow or move along paths of least resistance. A third aspect, since you're working in the environment, you want to adapt to that environment. That's what water does. So the three ideas of fluidity and action. Strength against weakness, paths of least resistance, and adaptability. But you people in the political party don't want this. <laughs> Once again, you see all this stuff, it all is very, it really is very true. Okay, so then you use all these kinds of things here. Play them together in order to play what we call the military, the dispersion concentration game. Sometimes you want to be dispersed, it'll become evident later on what it is. Sometimes you want to be concentrated. But you're shifting from dispersion to concentration back to forth. For what reason? That gives you a way of imposing your strength into your adversary's weakness. 
you already operate, always operate in one form, you tend to become predictable. If you're changing that form, then you can impose your strength into its weakness. It's a way of doing it. And why do you do that when you change these things around? You're playing all these things together to effect, to effect or to generate what we call surprise and shock. No, to effect, surprise and shock. What do I mean here? I don't surprise you. You don't surprise me. We treat it as an input. I do certain things. And if I'm clever about it, you are surprised. It's a reaction. It's an output. Shock is an output. Or you do things very cleverly as an output, then I become surprised or shocked. Yet you look at some of our military manuals, they treat shock and surprise like it's an input. It's not an input. It's an output. I don't surprise you. You really are surprised by my actions. It's a reaction to you because you can't cope, can't keep up, don't discern what's going on, whatever it might be. You really want to sort that out. You might say, well, this is true. I'll show you later on. It isn't. Because once you get that sorted out, then it gives you another way for applying leverage to somebody. Because the question becomes, then, what are these different things you do, or how do you play things together in order to get this reaction we call surprise and shock out of our energy? Come great point. We still have a moment we have shock action, not shock action. You do certain things, you place somebody into a state of shock. And if they're in a state of shock, they can't cope, they can't adapt, they become paralyzed, they don't know what to do. And that's essentially you. So this is sort of his theme. Later on, we'll define this term in my head, too. Very carefully. Right now, we're just gathering the evidence. And here's his strategy related to this theme. Note the first bullet. Get inside his organization. Those strengths, weaknesses, maneuvers, intentions, etc. How does he do that? Simple. Spines, reconnaissance, pride, every dirty trick we know today he knew back then. Matter of fact, you read his chapter on, on spine, he's talking about double agents. Oh, that's there. What's all that? <coughs> all those kinds of things. In other words, you're trying to do what? Understand, know your adversary. Remember his famous statement? Know your enemy, know yourself, win a hundred battles. Well, one of the ways to help know your enemy is through this intelligence, reconnaissance, and all these kinds of things. You get inside his mind. You don't mirror anything. And remember, in a much deeper sense, 